So, I'm now continuing with a new chapter on which addresses classification. So, classification is a task of using sensor data, for example, or data in general, but in our case, mostly sensor data, for example, images, in order to infer semantic information. So, for example, descriptions about the image. We can start with the very simple task we already addressed in the um, one of the first lectures where we're looking into how to, um, before the point operators, map intensity values to zero and one values, for example, to do foreground and background um, separation. So if I'm, for example, now interested in vegetation and I have this picture and the question is, what is vegetation in this image? So we can do this, as we did it kind of after the first two or three lectures, Say, okay, let's simply look into the intensity values of those pixels and then say if they are brighter or darker than something or maybe have more green than um, blue and red values in there, then we say it's classification. Otherwise, we say it's not classification. So if it's classification, we map it kind of to the black areas and otherwise to the white areas. If we kind of look to the input-output image, the re result is surprisingly good. So given that we just used the intensity values actually a very stupid and simple thresholding here, the result is not too bad. But, of course, in general, this does not hold. It's not that, that trivial. But kind of the task that we want to do is for every pixel in my output image, I want to assign a label to it. The label, in this case, is it is vegetation or it's not vegetation. So it's kind of a binary label, just two states, vegetation or non-vegetation. But what I'm doing, I'm basically adding semantic information to this image. So something that we humans know that there is vegetation in there and the concept of vegetation as we humans understand it should be transferred to this image data. But in, well in the end I want to do is I want to actually want to learn a function or obtain a function where input, the input of this function is my input image and the output so this function is basically a statement, yes, that's vegetation, or yes, that's, or no, that's not vegetation. For, in this case, for example, for every individual pixel. And this is what we call a classification problem. So we have a set of classes, omega 1 to omega k. So k classes, if we just have vegetation and non-vegetation, uh, k equals 2. So we just would have two classes, vegetation and non-vegetation. And we have features. It's called, in very abstract way, features, or in German, Merkmal, or some pattern that we have. What we want to do is we want to obtain a function f which maps this feature to a class output. So in our case, the feature would be the intensity value of a pixel. And based on the intensity values, we want to make a decision which class it does it belong to. We could also define three classes. So in this case, we could also say, let's say, a vegetation, street, and everything else. Or vegetation, street, sky, and everything else. And would have four classes. In most of the cases, or in a lot of kind of standard things we're considering at the moment, we just say we have two classes. But there's nothing against having multiple classes. Okay, so what we want to have, we want to obtain this function f so that I can input let's say every individual pixel, maybe even neighbors of pixels. This is my input to my magic function f and so the outcome are class labels. So in this case, in this simple example how this was generated was just really every pixel taken into account individually so e is just a single intensity value and um, the class we have is vegetation or non no vegetation so a binary output. What we're doing, the whole course is about how to get that F. How do we get an F that kind of brings semantic concepts that we have like vegetation, street, sky, bushes, trees, buildings, so that we have a system which can actually label, assign those semantic labels, the semantic information to the individual data points. So a very concrete example, if I'm analyzing satellite image data, so remote sensing data, 
I'm often interested in kind of analyzing this data and for example estimate the land use. So what kind of, for example, crop is growing there? Is this um, forest? Is this farmland? Things like this. So I have a large number of those images that I want to actually generate different classes, which are here just shown by different colors, which tells me what's the land use or the estimated land use giving me this input data. So what I want to do is I once want to learn this function, and once I have that function, I can actually use it on a large collection of different remote sensing images and can obtain very quickly an estimate about the land use of a very large area. It's one prominent example in classification in remote sensing applications. We can also have other things. If you want to analyze buildings, let's say we have a point cloud from a building like this one over here, maybe taken from a stereo camera system or maybe um, obtained from a laser scanner. We get this point cloud. Then we do some pre-processing steps. For example, we may do a triangulation to get a smooth surface. We may do some segmentation. And then for all of those segments, for example, I may want to estimate, okay, is this a roof? Or is this part of the building? Or is this ground structure? Then obtain, may obtain a classification like this one over here. I'm going to label like green is a roof, red is building, and blue is classification. And then I can, on top of this classification, then do an interpretation or further interpretation of the image, of what I see. Just as an example, what we can do with such a technique, given we get this semantic information in the, into this process. Or the other example is written text. So for example, I have characters from A to Z, 26 characters, and I have images of those characters, like there's a character A, I take a photo of the character A, or what your scanner does, and then I want to look into this data, which is just in this case an image, so it's consisting in this case of zeros and ones, and then I want to get an estimate what's the most likely class given this feature. So this is my feature description, my input image. I, I want to compute the most likely class given this feature vector. So this then tells me, oh, this is an A, what you've seen. I can do that for every character, and then I can automatically do in what's called an OCR. In order to do this decision over here, I need some input. I need to know which classes do I have, I need to know something like a sensor model. It tells me, okay, what's the probability of observing a given feature, given I know that the state, or in this case, the character is A. B, C, D, E, F, G, until Z. I need all of them. And I may also need to take into account how often does an A occur, or how often does an Z occur. So what's the kind of the general uh, probability that a letter, for example, is an A, or character is an A. If I have this information, I can actually maximize the probability of what is the class given this E. Okay, so to build this, I need to have these, so this is E, the specifying the number of classes, I need to have this quantities, and I need to have this quantities over here. So if you now want to obtain our function f, and we often say we want to learn this function f, we need to have additional information. So we need to have this additional information. How likely is it that an observation is obtained, or that I see a certain sequence of pixels, given I know the character is an A, or given I know that the character is a B? So it was this information over here. And you need to know the general, the prior, so the occurrence of those characters individually. So I need to have this, these probability distributions are essential for this classification system. And quite often, it's actually pretty hard to specify that. And you need to do that for all possible things that I can see, for all possible features, for all possible classes. So what the standard approach actually is that I'm not starting to specify those functions by hand. I try to estimate or to learn those distributions from data. So I assume to have some special data. 
It's also called training data. And I use this data in order to learn those distributions. What is training data? Training data are basically pairs consisting of features, so these E elements that can occur, for example, intensity values in our initial example, and a label. Saying, okay, so I, I take an image, I label everything by hand, which is vegetation, and then I have a couple of, of tuples of intensity values, vegetation, intensity value, vegetation, intensity value, vegetation, and a couple of so-called negative examples. Intensity value, no vegetation. Intensity value, no vegetation. So what I get, my training data, consists of vectors with known labels. And what I'm doing, I'm using this information in order to learn this function f. And so this data, this training data, needs to be provided to the system. Without this training data, I can't obtain my function f because f would be a general function and I don't have any further information. So what this kind of idea of what's what is called supervised learning is that I have some expert, and this expert is typically human, that provides examples to the system. So an example for every class. If you have only two possible classes, it's also called positive and negative examples. So for every class, I need to have a couple of examples. How does this class look like? And what the function then does, or the goal is then to learn such a function that given new observations or new features can make this decision. First, we want to do that if you even get the same data, we want to be able to obtain the same result. But we also want to generalize this to new things we haven't seen, but maybe very similar to what we have seen before. <clears throat> so this is typically means we need, to, we need a someone who provides training data, and often this is a human. And the, the hope is that we just need to label a small number of images, for example. So we have just a small set of training data. We can generalize this then later on to a large number of observations. That's the perfect case. Unfortunately, that's not always the case. And sometimes I need to have some support for the human supervisor. But the goal is to use these training examples in order to learn such a function, which then can make a decision on new data, so something we haven't seen so far. So it's actually very similar to a regression problem, something that you have, should have seen so far. The only difference is basically in classification, the output is a class label. So it's not a continuous uh, variable, a continuous value that we have. So we just say vegetation or non-vegetation. There's nothing in between. And the goal is typically to find a, often a separation, although it's not, it's not extremely precise, but maybe enough for now. We need to have something which separates the input space into something which belongs to class A and something which belongs to class B. So if I get a new input, I want to say, on which side of the decision boundary, for example, am I, in order to, um, to, to tell if this input corresponds to a positive or negative classification. In contrast to this regression, here the output is a continuous variable. And I typically have some input points, which I can also see as training data. And then I typically fit a function to these data points. This function can be a line, can be a parabola, or something like this. But from the concept, a very, very similar task. What I want to do is I have some training data. So this is some, let's say, information that I have about the, the function or the model I want to estimate. So if I have a set of given data points, I want to fit a function through that. So if I'm giving a new x value, I get also y value according to this function. So this is regression and this is classification. The main difference is the output. And for classification, I'm often also, it's good enough to have something which just separates the thing into classes. And we are looking here into classification. So whatever we do here, we're not looking into regression. We're looking to the classification problem. I just want to make the connection between classification and, and regression here. So is there any question about what classification is? I try to spend some time and do that kind of rather slowly in order to make sure you understand what classification is. 
there anything which is unclear? Something which I should repeat about what is classification? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there might also be classifications with more than two classes. Of course. So um, we can have classifications with, with n classes. So even if you, if you go back to the original description I had, uh, blah, blah, so or even this example, yeah. we, have, we have 26 classes over yeah. here. Um, typically, if I say, one says binary classification, that means we just have two possible outputs. So, and then one typically calls it a positive and a negative example because they're just two outputs. But in general, there are more than two possible outcomes. So the output here is always a class label, but it doesn't mean that there are only two, two classes. So there can be an arbitrary number, or a large number. Any further questions? OK, so maybe just to add that, you can actually use also regression techniques in order to do classification. For example, saying every of my um, positive examples I map to the output value 0 and all my negative examples I map to the output value 1. Then I learn this regression function there. So do I obtain a y value which is closer to 1 or closer to 0 and make my decision boundary? There's actually a set of classification techniques which heavily build on such regression techniques. But we, for the moment, want to look into the classification from a slightly different view. Start with a small example. Classification of cars, again a completely different example. We can really use this for any type of, um, of data that we have. So let's say we want to classify if a car is considered as a family car or is not considered as a family car, for example a sports car. So it's maybe not that easy to provide directly a function what does it mean to be a family car? We say, okay, our feature is a two-dimensional state. It's, on the one hand side, it has to do with how much it costs. And the second thing is something that has to do with engine power. The question is now, can we do such a decision based on those two inputs? So if we have a new car, we don't need to look to the whole car. We only need to have two-dimensional feature information, which is price and engine power, and then we want to learn a classification system which tells us this is a family car, yes or no. So example for those data would be whatever of data points would be um, 15,000 euro, 50 kW, and so on and so forth. Or, I know, and my training data looks exactly the same as the example values, but I have an, another element here which is a true or false which is my class label. So this is regarded to be a family car. This is also regarded to be a family car. This one is not regarded to be a family car. Of course, this one has a false in there and true. True means family car, false doesn't mean family car. So this is my training data. So given I have a couple of those training examples, my, my task is to, to build up a classifier which can ask a new question. Is something which costs 12,000 euros 65 kW, is this a family car, yes or no? Okay? Okay, so let's look into this one. So we now can plot this as a two-dimensional uh, two dimensional space. So we have price over here and engine power over there. And this is our feature vector. E consists of x1 and x2. So x1 is the price. And x2 is the engine power, so just the example we had before. And then I can take one of those points. So this point, for example, here corresponds to a price, a rather cheap car compared to the other, but also with the um, with small engine power. And these guys have a minus or a plus in there. Minus, like this one, means it's a negative example, and the plus over here means it's a positive example. So if I kind of let those positive and ne negative examples populate my space over here, the question is, how can we make a decision now if a new data point is a family car or is not a family car? Any ideas how we could do that? So 
So I give you a new data point, and I want you to make this decision. How could we do that? You are looking to the nearest neighbor. You can take the nearest neighbor or the next. So if you have k nearest neighbor, and if I have four which are positive, four which are negative, hmm, what should I do? Maybe if I start with the nearest neighbor or take an, an odd number, then I at least have a majority vote I can do. Um, so if I'm kind of ending up here, it's OK. This is the closest one that's likely to be a family car. Or I'm close to a more negative, to a negative one, this may be better. So one of the approaches is to do nearest neighbor classification. This is actually this, uh, these, the simplest classification method we will look into. Or we have some model and say, OK, we simply consider a box over here. And everything which is inside this box is supposed to be a family car, because all positive crosses lie in here. And everything which is outside is not a family car, because here I have all those negative examples. So this can be one model, my model C, my classifier, that I propose now, that's the truth. Whatever is in there is a family car, whatever is out there is not a family car. So the question is, are there other possible solutions given the training data? So assuming you have no other idea what's going on, so you don't have any background knowledge about those values because the computer doesn't have this background knowledge. So given the training data, this is the only knowledge that we have, are there other possible solutions which are in line with our training data, which is provided by a human expert, at least it's assumed to be it's a human expert or an expert? Are there other possible solutions? Yeah, I could make that more complex. Actually, I, I described the, the, the area of this uh, rectangle. Mm -hmm. So I could definitely give also, yes, and I could also specify a different area. Or I can specify a quite large number of different areas. And all of those areas, the black ones as well as the gray ones, are perfectly in line with the training data. So the training data per se, at least of, if I just take those into account as single points, with a positive and negative label, don't tell us that this one here is better than this one. Right? There are all these hypotheses classify all my training examples correctly. The first thing I typically want to have. But we can look into that and say, OK, we have kind of, if I draw two boxes, so let's say the smallest box which contains all the family cars, and the largest box, which does not contain a non-family car. You can see this as the most kind of general hypothesis, hypothesis, or the most specific hypothesis. And for the area in between that, I actually have not much information. Okay. Most specific one, most general one, so just pick one in there. This, the space in there is something which is also called a version space. So C is one element of the version space and everything. So if I, if I scale C between S and G, everything in there is something which is often called, also called a version space. So it's kind of, kind of the space between the most specific and the most general hypothesis. And somewhere in this version space lies the classifier that I want to have. What would be a good idea, or any ideas on how I should choose my classifier C so that this is a good idea? What, is, what makes intuitive, intuitively sense for you? What would you choose? If I need to commit you in one of those boxes, and I give you one of those boxes and says, this box should make the best decision about in the future, for new unseen data. Well, I would ask you how specific were you when you created the training data? So I just say, let's say this is a random sampling from all the cars which are out there. Now, all the cars which are out there, I just randomly pick a couple of those cars. They give me these labels. And now I want you to commit on something which hopefully does a good job. Of course, if you don't have any further information, you can't say that 
Ah, this is a good one. This is the right one. But let's say, can you make some assumptions and then get a good classifier? Good box. Kind of, to which box would you commit? Um, what do you mean with why you said you should use the C box? So okay. so that's true. S1 is an extreme one, G1 is an extreme one, and, but C, I can scale any C in there. But you're very close to the solution, or to this solution, to a very popular solution. So I generate a box, which I regard as my decision boundary. There's everything which is inside the box is positive, which everything which is outside my box is negative. So it's a decision boundary. What I'm doing, I'm kind of maximizing the distance from my decision boundary to the most general and to the most specific hypothesis. So then this kind of looks like this. I come up with a function h, and I have the margin between the most specific and the most general one, and I pick those where the margin on both sides are equal. Let's say, assuming that the, the negative ones are somewhere around the negative ones, at least to somehow similar to my training data, same holds for the positive one, that's actually a pretty good decision. And there are techniques which do this, which are also called support vector machines, also a couple of other techniques, which try to do exactly this, and this would be kind of the support vectors, those which define my most general, most specific hypotheses, and then I'm trying to maximize the margin. That's one way for doing classification. Before we actually want to look into the classifiers and how to build such a classifier, I would like to talk a little bit about an error. What is a classification error? You can say, okay, a classification error, what is such a classification error? So let's assume that this box here is the ground truth. So this is the correct classifier for my cars. And now assume that the one to which I committed to, because I had no further information, I, did not, I do not know, I only have my training data, I do not know that green is the right thing to do. And I said, okay, I select red, because I like red more, for whatever, for whatever reason, this is what I computed. So this is a classifier that I selected, and this is the unknown ground truth, the green one. So in the areas where red and green do not overlap, so especially this area, this area, and this area, as well as this area, I make mistakes, right? So whenever I have a sample in here, my red one would say that's a family car, but in reality it's not. Whenever I'm here, the red one says, oh, that's not a family car, although in reality it is a family car. So I've kind of these two types of errors. And those dashed lines can therefore be, can be separated into what's called the false positives and the false negatives. The false positives are those which are wrongly classified and they're classified as positive examples, in this case family cars. The false negatives are those which are wrongly classified but which are, and which are classified as negative ones. So negative means no family car, although it's a family car in reality. And kind of I have this area over here. What I intuitively want to do, I want to kind of, of course, reduce this area. I want to have this area as small as possible. The only problem that I have is that I don't know the green one. I don't know how the green area looks like. Because that's the ground truth. That's what I want to have. OK, let's look a bit more into these false positives, false negatives. There are kind of four possible outcomes for a binary classification problem, or for a classification problem. The first thing is, in our case, a family car is correctly classified as a family car. That's something we like, which is good. This is what's called a true positive. It's a correct output, and the output is positive. So family car is classified as family car. Then I again have my false negatives ones, which is they are wrongly classified, and the, and the classifier says no, it's not a family car. So if this is wrong, this means it's a family car which is wrongly classified as a non-family car. This is my false negatives. 
Then I again have the, what's called the true negatives. There's something which is the classifier did, a good, did the correct job and the result is belong to the negative class. So it's a non-family car which is correctly classified as a non-family car. And then the remaining part which is the false positive that we just discussed. We have a non-family car which is wrongly classified as a family car. These are my false positives. So this was kind of for my concrete example. Also can formulate that in a more general way. True positives are all positives examples which are classified as positives. The false negatives are all positive examples which are classified as negative ones. True negatives are all negative examples which are classified as negatives and false positives are all negative examples which are wrongly classified as positives. You want to specify the classification error, those values here matter. So I can actually often write this in this form over here as possible outcomes. So what is here is what the reality is. What I hear is how they are classified as. So in reality, it's positive, classified as positive is a true positive. In reality, negative plus classified as positives is a false positive, and so on and so forth. So it's something which you probably have seen as a confusion matrix for two classes. Or may have seen. It's exactly the same concept that we have in here. So if you evaluate a classifier, especially if, if you go over multiple classes, those confusion matrices can be large and can be not as nice um, the illustrated. So therefore, we, there are a few other things which are used for evaluating those classifiers. And they are typically different quantities that are plot against each other, especially if my classifier has also certain parameters and the parameters affect my result. So for example, it's something which is called precision. Precision is the number of true positives divided by the number of test outcomes which are positive, so the sum of those two values. Again, if this value is close to one, that's something which is good because it means the ratio between those which are in reality positive and those which I classify as positive is one, which is something which is good. And there are a large number of other different things. So um, sensitivity is something which is often taken into account, uh, which are the true positives divided by those which are in reality positive. And so whenever there's some weird term coming up, some evaluation, pop up the slide, and then you can actually try to understand what's going on. And also know that there are different names. So sensitivity is also something which is very often called the recall or the true positive rate. They're kind of, depending on which community started, or looked into that, different names are popular. And one of the things which is often taken into account is the false positive rate and the true positive rate. The false positive rate is the probability that a randomly selected and in reality negative example is classified as a positive one. So it's just kind of number of false positives divided by the false positives plus the false negatives. It's my false positive rate. And the true positive rate are those which are, so it's kind of the probability that a randomly selected and reality positive example is classified as a positive one. So just by this value. So given my matrix is my four entries, I can compute the rest. What I now can do is I can actually plot those values against each other and I can vary a parameter, at least one parameter. And then one can actually see plots which looks like this one. So here's a false positive rate, the true positive rate. So what I want to do, the perfect case is my false positive rate is low. So false positive is low, but true positive is high. So the perfect case, my false positive rate is zero and my true positive rate is one. So the perfect classifier is it sits upon here in this corner. If I'm somewhere along this red line, basically means I do random guessing. If I'm on this red line, I'm basically randomly guessing um, what, I'm, what I'm doing. So the more I go in this direction, the better my classifier is. The more I go down here, the worse the classifier gets. So if I have a classifier which takes certain parameters into account, I can actually vary those parameters and plot individual points. For this one, for example, I have one parameter 
And I, in a threshold, for example, and I vary the threshold, I actually get this curve over here. So the more I go in this direction, the better it is. The more I go down here, the worse it is. And sometimes, or very often, it depends on the application that I'm using. If I'm willing to accept, let's say, a few false positives, but I want to make sure I get all true positives. Or, it's actually more often the case, I'm happy to miss a few positive examples, but the negative ones are really critical. So if you think about, um, it's a slightly different example, but we can use the same thing for evaluating how well we can actually find correspondences in images. So how often do I assign a feature to the right, to his right, correct corresponding partner? I'm typically fine in missing a few correspondences, so not finding a few correspondences, because not having, of course, I would like to have the more the better, but it's not really critical to me to miss a few corresponding features quite often. But if I make a wrong data association, it typically screws up my model. So in this case, I'm more interested in getting my false positive rate as close to zero as possible, and maybe I'm still happy to live with whatever, a 0.2 true positive rate. That means I only obtain 20% of the right correspondences, but at least I know that they are pretty good. So depending on your application, you may want to minimize the false positive rate or maximize the true positive rate. And this is something which is called the rock curve, which is often used in approaches in order to, um, for example, evaluate those systems. Other things which I use is something which is called a precision recall, precision recall plot. Again, very similar. Precision is the probability that a randomly selected positively classified example is positive in reality. And the recall is a probability that randomly selected in reality positive example is also is classified as a positive one. Okay, then, then you get typically this precision recall plots which look like this. So if you look into a paper, you, simply, you, you have different methods and different parameters. So the kind of what you often see these plots. So the more you go in this corner, the better you are right now. This is the method of my competitor. This is the method of my competitor. This is our method. We are better. And you vary the parameter and then you, yeah. So this is something that you often see in papers when you evaluate those systems. But again, it always depends on kind of how much do you want to bring your precision or your recall to one? How much does this impact your, um, your system? They always also approach is trying to kind of combine that into one single value. So it's sometimes hard to read those plots, although those plots are typically very, very informative on how this kind of the shape of those lines look like. You can actually compute this, for example, computing precision recall, something which is called the, the F score or F measure or F1 score, which is basically the harmonic mean between the precision and the recall. And um, this is one value if you just kind of want to rank them according to one single value as your classifiers. There's something which one can use. So the more the F-score goes to one, the better it is. The more it goes, closer it goes to zero, the worse the performance of your system is. Taking into account only the precision and the recall. Again, there's a large number of those measures. These are just a few examples on how one can actually use that. So this is kind of the, how I can, can look or should look into the error when I evaluate a classifier. Okay, so, so kind of these four different values, true positives, true negatives, false positives, false negatives, and based on those, I can compute different numbers of parameters or scores or generate plots which allow me to evaluate the performance of my classification system. Are there any questions so far about what I presented here? Okay, so then... I'm actually done for today. What we're doing next week is kind of you start looking into how we can actually design a classifier and then look into different classification systems, go into the details on how to learn such a function and how to come up with a classification system. Sorry? We have, sorry, lecture in this week. So this Thursday, this Thursday is the next lecture in two days. Okay. Thank you very much.